Welcome, I'm Melvo Persico. Come with me, meet new people, and learn from their experiences as we take our culture to the world. And our guest today is a very special guest, Dr. Pauline Baird. And I say Pauline is a special guest because she is the person who inspired me to do this program. So it's only fitting that I have her today as the first guest on this our inaugural program to our culture to the world. So please introduce yourself. Who is Dr. Pauline B? <laughs> Thank you, Mel. Um, it's really heartening to hear that you know I inspired you. That's why I tell stories. I tell stories that we can learn from each other and we can go places. Well, Dr. Pauline Baird was not always a doctor. I grew up in Buxton, Guyana, mm -hmm. um, on the east coast of Demerara, humble beginnings. Um, my father, Buddy Baird, Fitz Baird, Megan Baird Griffith from the Watson family, and so on. Um, I am a sister and aunt and so on. And I'm also an educator, educator for more than you know, I might out myself my age <laughs> <laughs> for at least 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. I started at 17. So go figure. And I've taught uh, um, in quite a few places around the world. You know, I taught in um, Guyana, of course, Trash Bay Elementary School, um, Buxton Community High School, um, Luzignan Elementary School. And then I taught in Trinidad and Tobago, um, then in Palau, in Guam, in Japan, in the United States. Those are a few other places. And I've lived in those places. So basically I've lived outside of Guyana for about 30 years and I really like it. And my hobbies are gardening and the traveling. Well, with the COVID you can imagine, it's hard. Yes, um, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, that's, those are some of my hobbies. And I love marketplaces. When I go abroad, you can find me in the marketplaces or the bookstore. I love a market. It's, and not just for, you know, uppity market, but the fishes and the fruit and eating the local stuff. Yes, yes. You really get to experience the culture in the markets. Yes. So I have a little visual I'm just going to show quickly. I know I don't have everything everywhere that you've been to, but, um, you know, you, you've gone from Guyana and you've gone to you know different places like Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. You've gone um, across the world. Um, uh, you mentioned Palau. You mentioned um, you know Japan, Guam, different places, even the United States. So it's really fitting what I have here that you are really a world traveler. You have gone from Guyana to the world. And we, today you're gonna to share your experiences living mainly in Palau with us. And of course, I know you, you've lived for quite some time in Japan. At a later date, we're gonna have you back to share those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Pauline, tell us, when you went to Palau first, what were your first impressions? Were, did you have any culture shock experiences, you know, coming from the Caribbean to, way across the world? How was that for you? Well, yes, to be honest, you, you have culture shock. Um, first of all, before I got to Palau and I learned I was going to Palau, I was a volunteer. And when I learned I was going to Palau, I had to go look it on the map. I couldn't find this thing. These were tiny, tiny, tiny islands. And I was thinking, Oh my goodness, what kind of experiences would be? Because remember, I'm from Guyana, flat coastal plains and things like that. So when I got there, I realized that it was one of the most beautiful places on earth. I call it God's country. Wow. What you see in the picture are the 70 islands. They are the untouchable 70 islands that are preserved, like a um, what do you call it? Uh but then there's a name you call them, like when you preserve a place. Oh, I, um, I cultural. Know. I think by UNESCO right. has the, um, 
or my yes. intangible, I, I can't remember the yes, exact that, yes, um, assets yes. or something like that. Yes, I, I'll probably yes. I'll put a little writing about that. Yes, but yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, I, can't, I couldn't remember the word, mm -hmm. but that's um, the 70 islands. But Palau has um, five islands that are connected by causeways. And there's a big island, Babadab, that I lived on. And there's some outer islands that people inhabit. I think there are over 300 islands total that make up this nation of Palau. Palau looks like a number of little islands they have called the rock islands. And they emerge out of this aquamarine ocean like broccoli, well manicured. And so I lived there for nine, nine years and I never got used to beauty. Every time you drive across a cause with another island, it's water on both sides. So it's usual to see kayaks going back home with people and birds flying back to the islands and people on boats coming back. But when I got there, I didn't know a Palawan from a Filipino, from a Chinese, a Taiwanese, nothing. Because, you know, in Guyana, every Asian person is Chinese. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Palawans look, what I would say, they look like they have African heritage, some of them. So in a distance, they're brown skin, some of them. Some of them have curly hair like me. Some of them have hair like you. Sometimes they look like Amerindian. Sometimes they look like mix. So it was nice seeing this array of skin tones, but what tricked me up, I would see a person in the distance. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a black man. And there's nothing like living abroad and not seeing yourself that when you see a black person, it's like Christmas. <laughs> I didn't even know I could be like that, as I could miss black skin tones. And so you were so excited. Yes, I would see this person and say, oh, it's a black person, and get up there, it's a Palawan. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the first thing I wrote back to my college, because I had taken a year off of college in Trinidad and Tobago to do this, this um, service of teaching overseas, um, I wrote back and said, people here, men here wear lipstick. That was my first impression. Because it's like, how oh, I got hands to the lipstick here? You can see men mouth look so. Hmm. And the reason they choose something called a beetle nut. Have you heard of a beetle nut? Yeah, I've heard of a beetle nut, yes. Right. It's like a little coconut ball for those guys, for Guyanese, like a, like a palm nut when the coconut mm -hmm. is very, very young. Mm -hmm. But it comes from a tree that's called a beetle nut tree. And they would chew that thing. It's a mild narcotic. And they would put it together. They cut it in half or bite it in half, take out the inside, pack it with limestone. They call it lime. Piece of, piece of tobacco, wrap it with a leaf called a pepper leaf. I never seen this leaf on a tree, but, and then they would take it and tuck it in here in the folds of their mouth. So it's not unusual to see people like this. Mm -hmm. And they chew on it's it. One side big, mm -hmm. yes. And then they spit. Mm -hmm. Mel, let me tell you about the spit. You could see people put their finger like this and spit, they make an arc go five feet. And one of the first things I learned is not to pick up cans, you know, Coke bottle, um, you know, Coke cans or Seven Up cans because people spit in cans mm -hmm. and things like that. So that was one of the shocker for me. Um, so you thought they wore lipstick? Why the beetle nut cause the lipstick? Yes, it, there's a chemical reaction, mm -hmm. and that chemical reaction colors the mouth, mm -hmm. and not only that, the teeth, the mm -hmm. teeth are black. And from what I understand, in the Pacific, in the Micronesian and um, Melanesian area, black teeth was a sign of beauty. So you have a girl, a beautiful girl, and when she smiles, black, but that was a sign of beauty. That's okay. what I heard. Interesting. Yes. yes. Wow. But, but it, it, can, it can cause cancer. Yeah, I've heard it, that, yes. Mm -hmm. It can wear away your gums and teeth and cause some kind yeah. of mm -hmm. issues, yeah. yeah. yeah and so man, woman, and child too. Wow, very much a part of the culture. Yes, yes. so um, I cut you off, but you were gonna share another culture shock experience you had. Yes, now, when a mother gives birth, a couple of days after, or week, no, weeks or so after, they have what they call a, a birthing ceremony. It's not when the mother actually gives birth, 
but it's a celebration of this birth. We call it birthing ceremony or nast, right? And um, the woman comes out. Depending on her family and her clan, she would dress a certain way, it's with a certain headpiece. And this headdress could be colorful flowers and, you know, um, woven palm, coconut palm, and she wears a grass skirt. But what was a little bit of a shock for me was that when the woman comes out on this day with music and celebration, her, she bears her boobs. So all her boobs are outside. Mm -hmm. And you know, like in Guyanese um, Indian culture, I don't know if it's Muslim or Hindu, but before the wedding, they would use a turmeric and dye you with the oil and so on. That mm -hmm. happens. She gets a special treatment for maybe three to seven days. It depends on the clan and the ranking of the clan, I understand, and the mm -hmm. traditional customs. The honor of Palau is divided into clans. Everybody belongs to a clan. And that's why they have certain kind of certain kinds of um, relationships with the land that you just can't own land because land wrapped up in clans and it's a matrilineal mm -hmm. society and all of that. So the woman would come out to the music and they would dance and they would put money on her and things like that. And the feast, I've never seen feast like that in my life. You talk about fish, the biggest fish, the different kinds of Edo and so on. But the food, I've never seen so much food in one place ever. <laughs> and <laughs> honest, <laughs> all kinds of sushi, sashimi, sweet meats, fish, varieties of fish prepared so many different ways. So that's the second thing. Now we're talking about sashimi. Have you had sashimi? No, I've never had sashimi. <laughs> well, you're missing out. I've, seen it, I, I've know, seen it, but I've never had it. I used to read about this sashimi, right? And I couldn't understand. I used to think that it's very gamey and kind of chewy until I got on a boat and I told that story elsewhere and saw the men, you know, get the fish out of the ocean, chop it up right away. They come with their fixings, the soy sauce, the onions, the pepper, and put it in. And I tried it. First, I tried it with a little bit of coconut just to see if I could taste it because I thought it was, it was gonna be fishy. But when I actually tried it, I liked it. It was unlike anything I'd ever eaten. And it was fresh out of the ocean. So that, that was an experience in itself. And the next one that I like to talk about is with the kids. I was teaching the third grade and I asked them a question one day and nobody answered. Well, you know, in Guyana, when you're teaching, you got to answer, right? So I asked them again, no answer. So I said, why aren't you answering? No answer. This was strange. So I picked on one of them. I said, come along, why aren't you answering? And he said, teacher, we are. We're answering, teacher. I said, but you didn't. None of you are answering. He said, yes. And this one named Malus, Malus said, yes, teacher. And I said, I didn't hear you. And he said, look, teacher, look. And I looked, Mel, there were 12 pairs of brows going like this. Ooh. They were telling me yes. So in but not, Palau, not verbally. <laughs> right, they speak with the face. They speak with the face. They can tell you things with their brows and with their face. And they can learn about you. They're a sense, a people sensing set of people. They onto you like that. And so I learned not to listen for my answers, but to look for my answer. And silence speaks. If you ask something and nobody answers you, they've spoken. Right. Pay attention to the um, body language in the face. Not only the body language is silent. Just, just, they could be looking at you and saying nothing at all, not even saying anything with their face. Wow. So when kids would ask me, teacher, can I go to the bathroom? If I am annoyed and go, they're just gone. They're gone because I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> those are a couple of the things that you know got me yeah. yes i'm sure interesting experiences i know when you um you know you come in from a completely different culture and having to um get get used to this um new way of being and you know with people in this area so how was it for you now adapting to this 
strange foreign culture. Well, you know what? That was, it wasn't so strange after all because they eat taro, which is our edo. They eat taro leaf, which is our edo leaf, but you got to get for your, your cook up rice and so, and they would eat the edo leaf with coconut milk. They would mm -hmm. prepare cassava, they would call tapioca in so many different ways, Mel. Mm -hmm. so that I learned a few things. They would grind it up with like, they would roast it and blacken it and then grind it up, put it in banana leaf, like, like how we make conky. Mm -hmm. But they would put it, the, the cassava inside, but it's elongated. Mm -hmm. And they would wrap it up with this with string, banana leaf string and they would boil it inside. Oh my goodness, so good. And when the old women serve it, they cut it up in small pieces and they would pour fresh coconut milk on top. Mm, I could eat some right now. And what so, was that called? What is that called, that dish? It's tapioca. Oh, okay, tapioca. okay. But they, again, different people prepare it very differently. So you've got the variety of ways of preparing it. Um, I... I found that I was well received by the community. I was the only black teacher there at the time. Um, and they, the people adopted me. Like I, I, you know, I would go to a certain family, like the Otong family. This, and he would say, Bear, come over. And then I would go over and you know, stay with them and barbecue and different things. Um, there was an old lady named Remose. And Remose, she didn't speak English and I didn't speak Palawan because Palawan is a very difficult language to speak, but gutturals and labials mm -hmm. um, and so on. And, you know, she would invite me, they would send a message to tell me to come with them, they're going to a funeral. And funerals are something else. People would, they would have the dead right there and they would have food. And I'd never seen people eat beside the dead, but mm -hmm. it's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but they trusted me enough to invite me into those spaces where they're chewing and singing and having their dead and so on. And I think it's, it's, it's a way of welcoming me into their spaces. Mm -hmm. And I don't think every foreigner gets that experience. I would go on a boat with them for miles, get on a boat and go God knows where. Near along, you know, Malagayok all these places to funeral with old ladies and they're singing. And Grandma said, used to touch my hand. She used to just rub my hand like this, you know, like that, just to let me know that I'm, I'm well accepted. So, all right, and you're welcome. You're part of the community. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And so you actually, you, you felt at home. Yes, 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 yes. And the food wasn't very strange. I eat curry rice. Oh, talking about curry rice. Let me tell you, I learned to eat a rice that I can't eat Guyana rice anymore. I learned to eat the sticky rice. So much so that when I eat Guyana rice, the rice too loose. It fly up my nose. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it's kind of like they use a lot of liquid. The um, the rice is kind of no, clammy. It's a variety of rice. It's a oh, variety it's a type of rice. of rice. Okay, okay. And then they cook it in the rice cooker, so it comes together mm -hmm. like sticky rice. They have it in Japan too. It's all over Asia. And then I went and introduced my niece and nephew to it, and they that's all they want to eat: sticky rice. Okay, yeah, right. So you you adapted. You adapted. Yes. Okay. So what aspects of Palawan life would you say have had the biggest impact on you? I would say family life and orientation to work, um, hospitality. Let me start with family life. When I got to that school, I was being a Guyanese. I was already a trained teacher, so you give homework. So I would give homework during the week and I would give homework on a Friday. One day the secretary called me. She said, Baird, don't give homework on a Friday. It mm -hmm. will never get done. So I said, why? She said, weekends are family times and parents don't want to do homework. And if you give them homework, they'll be very angry with you. Okay. They will come here and scream at you. <laughs> yes. And what I didn't know at the time 
is that on Friday afternoon, where we had a half day school on Friday, from Friday afternoon, sometimes those kids, domestic helpers will come and pick them up, just pick them up, take them straight to the boat landing, get on a boat and they're gone to the rock islands. And there are several rock islands that families will go and camp all weekend. So those mm -hmm. kids, they have on their little shorts under their uniform and they collect the clothes and they're gone. They cook out there, they fish, they have a good time. Mm -hmm. And so family life and family time was sacred. Mm -hmm. Very, very sacred. Mm -hmm. And you know, Palauans use their family bonds to, for economic benefit, for social mobility. So let's say you got married, so to speak, because marriage is literal in some senses. Man get together with woman, they're married, literally. Um, they would have what they call house parties. And house parties is not a party that you get people at your house and you dance and sing. No, this house party is like a throwing up of money for someone to build their house. So if you get married or you are coming up in life and you need a house for your family, you get together with your clan people and they have a party and they put money together and they give you a house. If you need a boat, they do the same thing. And if you're reluctant to participate, well, karma, because you need family, right? For that kind of stuff. Um, orientation to, I talk about family and orientation to work. At my school, there was often this push to give kids extra work have extracurricular activities. You know, they should be at the church. They should be at this function and that function. And I learned a valuable lesson from these kids. One kid said to me one day, teacher, your um, school is not my life. School mm -hmm. is not my life. And I took it to heart and have learned and one of the takeaways from leaving there was my work is not my life. Yes. And I've mm -hmm. taken that mm -hmm, as a way of being, even now, from that culture. Yes. yes. So I did family life, orientation to work. What's the other one? I, I think you mentioned hospitality. Hospitality. Mm -hmm. Now, plants are very hospitable. Your Guyanese are, you come, you come to Guyanese house, they would tell you, come in and eat whatever they have. The same thing with Palau. There is no reservation so to speak and people don't have to fancy up the house to ask you in they're a very simple living and that's another point that i can talk about taking away that was impactful on my life you don't have you need things you don't need a lot of things in your life you see you come from western cultures sometimes you gotta have the this and the that and uh -uh. they have really nice boats and houses are simple you know open they get an outdoor kitchen they call it dirty kitchen you know, like we have kitchen attach mm -hmm. and people scrape their fish, everything rink and stuff. You come to my house, they cook the fish, they give you the edo bile in the skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Thanks. you learn to live very simple and to appreciate the simple things in life. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's important. That's so important. So what about some other aspects of Palawan traditional culture that you were exposed to while living there? Right, that's so important because traditions are a big thing in um, Palau. You know, they have a structure that's unlike us, they have a chief and a high chief, paramount chief, Yutaka um, Gibbons, and his sister who's the the, the, his counterpart, um, the Bilum, Gloria Sally, but she's higher than him because of the matrilineal society. Mm -hmm. So I was able to rub shoulders with them, so to speak, if you can say that. You know, I've been to their homes, I slept at her house, which is not the normal thing, but that because she was SDA and I was at the time, and I taught their dog. Mm watch how they would care for the people in the culture if you didn't have food you would go to them and it's an oral culture they have lots of oral traditions just like we have our stories mm -hmm. but the fascinating thing about their stories is that their stories are carved in wood and storyboards mm -hmm. so you get the Emily story where this girl and her lover 
went to Ngamalis Island, that's the high chiefs, the high chief Ibadol's island. And they used to go there on certain moonlight night and have their goings on. And one time when they were having their affairs, she couldn't find her skirt. So she had to go back home without the skirt. But the next time they met, they were gonna meet at this new, this full moon or something. You see the moon in the picture there mm -hmm. on the storyboard. So they were gonna meet there. And when they met again, a turtle came and the turtle had her skirt on one of his fins or legs. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Palauans got to know um, about the moon and, the, and when the turtles would come and lay their eggs at the beach. So they kind of count time with that. And if I made a mistake with the story, Palawans, excuse me and forgive me, because that's the gist of the story. Right. So these storyboards are carved by people, artisans that can do this job. I remember one of my um, relationships in terms of getting to know people, not man woman relationship, but how you connect with people. There was a, a young man in Benaya. He was in jail. I used to go visit on Saturdays. And Benaya used to look forward to me going to the jail. And you talk about hospitable, he would take me into the jail. The, the jail had lots of shacks, like, and you could go into jail and sit along with the prisoners. And it was fun to when I when I go, they would they would ask me, Pauline, what do you want to drink? You think I'm at somebody's house? They would <laughs> offer me sodas and different things. And he would carve storyboards. So every time I would leave, he would give me storyboards. And that's how they make a living in the jail. Okay. Um, now you couldn't buy those storyboards. They're super, super expensive now, but I used to pay my pittance. Um, another aspect of the culture, they tell stories orally that they know their traditions and they teach morals and ways of being by telling the stories in Palawan. So yeah, there's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yes, so, so I, I can imagine how, how, how rewarding and how I, I can imagine it's so exciting for you, you know, experiencing all these aspects of that culture that were um, so very, in, in some cases, in some cases there were similarities, as you mentioned before, but in others, right. they were um, so different to things that you were used to. For instance, you know, right. having that kind of association with um, people who were in prison and, and, and experiencing hospitality from them and so on, and then having the... Um, you know, these, you know, for instance, we would just, I would just look at that and say, oh, that's kind of a wood carving. But then there's mm -hmm. actually a story and so an aspect of the life and the tradition and the, the, the legends of the people mm -hmm. and the way they experience life and they, um, what I want to say, they relate to, to nature. Mm -hmm. All of that is yeah. in that carving that storyboard oh, very, very. you know mel now that you mentioned that um i always wonder when people pick up artwork when they go around the world do they really understand what goes into that artwork and what happens i'm always one for who's the artist and what's behind it i remember a kid gave me a, a, a storyboard of a, a buy a buy is a men's meeting house i think the word a buy comes from japanese and the men's meeting house with men, traditional chiefs and so on would meet and deliberate. And they're all over Palau. She gave me that abai, but it was tiny and it was light. Not those, those storyboards are heavy. Mm -hmm. And because they, they're carved out of mahogany and cedar, I think, cedar, I think, I'm not sure, but mostly mahogany. Um, and they grow the mahogany there. So this girl gave me this one, it was light. And I liked it and I wanted more like it to give us to friends. But then she told me she couldn't get another one because her dad carved it when he was in jail. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a home I used to go to, prominent person. I used to go to this, their home. I never knew that man was in jail. He was wrongly jailed mm -hmm. and he carved it there. I treasure that storyboard to this day I have it. I, wherever I travel, I take that storyboard with me because it endeared me. Not only it had the tradition on it, but the story behind the man yes. and his work was so impactful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, I, I can well imagine. So you really had a lot of rich experiences, experience, you know, having experience in Palawan culture. Now, 
what opportunities did you have now to share your Guyanese culture with the people in Palau? Uh, 